you want to throw a run or not? Really? We'll just hold off. Did you have any off the game? We'll hold off for the time being then. But we're going to go back to our Bible study like we've been studying. And we've been looking at, do you remember what book? Oh. We've been looking at Psalms. And do you remember how many divisions the book of Psalms was broken up into? We know it by the books. Book 1, book 2, and so on. You remember, Daniel? Very good. It was broken up into five different books. And they all go back and relate to the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So just turn to the book of Psalms because we'll be spending a lot of time there today looking at another psalm. Last week, we looked at the book of Psalms, but we looked at it in a way that we could see Christ in it. And what I mean by that is we actually went through the book of Psalms and looked at prophecy concerning Jesus Christ where we could go back and see, hey, this psalm and this verse talks about the Messiah and it predicts uh, his part of his crucifixion or it predicts his birth, it predicts him as king. And it's actually talking about Jesus Christ. We didn't take anything out of context and say, this is what I think, this is what I think. But we looked at the word of God and saw from the book of Psalms and the New Testament that this passage, without a shadow of a doubt, he is speaking about or is written concerning Jesus Christ. And that was important because we're getting ready to look at the trilogy of Psalms. And what I mean by that, and that is my term for it, but we're looking at Psalms chapter 22, 23, and 24. These three Psalms talk about and describe the office, offices of Jesus Christ. Psalm chapter 22, do you remember which office that is describing? Well, let me back up. Do you remember what the three offices of Christ are, or were, and will be? When we look at Psalm 22, it's describing him as his office as prophet, which is what Christ was when he was on this earth. He was in the role of a prophet. When we look at Jesus Christ right now, the office that he holds is that of high priest, or him as our priest. That is described in Psalm 23. And then finally, Psalm 24 describes the future office of Jesus Christ as king when he comes down from heaven with his armies and takes the throne of his father David and sits down and rules for a thousand years when he will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now before we go any farther, we're just going to flip back and finish up. I think we have two more, two more, more key words to go over and then we're done with that section. So if we go back to our key words on page 13, we're going to look at, I think it's pronounced Shigiyama, and it's only used one time in the entire Bible, in Psalm chapter 7 and verse 1. And there the Bible reads, Shigion of David, which he sang unto the Lord concerning the words of Cush than Benjamin Knight. So what is Shigion? According to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it means a dithyram or a rambling poem. So it's the type of poem that was written here. Adam Clark claims that it means to wonder or a wandering song. Perhaps David wrote this song when he was running from the wrath of King Saul. Spurgeon claimed that it meant variable songs or a type of songs. And then we're going to move on to Shoshana, which is used in Psalm 45 and verse 1 and 69 1. 
So Psalm 49.1, I'll read there. Where the Bible reads, To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Let me go to 69.1. I know that's one of them, I'm just not sure where it fell on there. But Psalm 69 and verse 1. To the chief musician upon Shoshannon, a psalm of David. So when we look at Shoshannon, it is, occurs in 15 verses of the Bible, only twice in the book of Psalms, and according to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it means a lily, as a flower of arch, ornament, or also a straight trumpet. So when we look at so, uh, Shoshannon, Shannon, in this verse, every time it was used, uh, the Hebrew word was translated Excluding the Psalms, it was translated lily or lilies, and your verses are there. Some believe that this was to be played upon an instrument shaped like a lily or resembled a lily, such as a trumpet. While Spurgeon himself believed that it was probably the title of the song, which was probably meant to be upon the lilies. We talked about these large words in the past. A lot of their meaning has been lost to history, so we're doing our best to study it out. We may not know the exact words, but we get meaning, but we get an idea or a connotation on what was meant by it. Sometimes it was just the title of a song. Sometimes it was the melody. Sometimes it was the instrument that it, the song itself was to be played on. And then finally, we'll finish with this one because this will conclude the key words. Shoshanim Medeth. That is found in Psalm 80 and verse 1. Where the Bible reads, To the chief musician upon Shoshanim Edith, a psalm of Asaph. So when we look at this word, it, in the English word, it occurs only in one verse in the entire Bible. It comes from the, I'm not even going to say the Hebrew word, but the Hebrew word appears twice in the entire Bible. Psalm 60 and 1, and Psalm 80 and 1. According to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it means... Basically, a lily as well, or lily of assemblage. It could be the title of a popular of the psalm itself. It could be that it was meant to be played upon a trumpet. The fact is this: is that it was used in Psalm 61, and also, even though the English word was not there, the Hebrew word was used in Psalm 60 and verse four. I got that a little backwards. I think that meant 80 and 1 too, because it was used in those two passages. So, if you look at 60 and 1, there's a different spelling for it. Uh, Shushan does, but they mean exactly the same thing. So, here we have the Hebrew word meaning the exact same thing with two different spellings used throughout the Bible. But they both mean lily, a trumpet, something along those lines. Now, getting back to what we were talking about, if you want to turn to Psalm 22, that is where we're going to spend the majority of today. Psalm chapter 22. We've already talked about the importance of Psalm 22 to some degree because it goes hand in hand with Psalm 23 and Psalm 24. All those in chronological order as well indicate and describe Christ in his three offices. That is prophet when he was here on the earth in Psalm 22, which we'll be covering today. Psalm 23, which describes him in his office as priest. And Psalm 24, which will describe him in his office as king. The other interesting thing about Psalm 23, uh, 22 is it was written more than 500 years before crucifixion ever was even invented by the Persians. Yet, we have in perfect detail the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in Psalm 22. There are two divisions to Psalm chapter 22. That consists of the agony of the believer in verses 1 through 21, and that of thanksgiving in 22 to 23. 
22 through 31. Now, keeping the tradition as we have, and it's not that lengthy of a passage, I will go ahead and read Psalm 22. Now, we will be discussing key words, phrases, and verses as we've had in the past, so you might want to keep your ears open or follow along, and we'll discuss that here immediately following. But Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of thy womb, out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from my from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gape upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name upon unto thy brethren, upon unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. Fear him, all ye seed, the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard him. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. So when we look at this psalm, as we've already said, it describes in perfect detail the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is broken into two sections. The agony of the believer and that of the thanksgiving. So as we look at this passage here, what might be some of the key words that we would pull out to describe this entire passage in a nutshell? And we will praise him. So praise. What else might be used to describe this passage?
What are some key words that we see appearing over and over and over? He was troubled. So um, that would be a key word because when we look at the first 20 verses, he's talking about agony and trouble and where he's at. Is there anything else we might find used over and over and over? His strength is dried up, so he is weak. So fear, trouble, he's weak. Maybe perhaps God, because that's who he's crying out to through this entire passage. He's crying out to God, and then he gives thanks to God. So God is used in reference throughout this entire passage. We might, like I said, fear, because he's in agony and anguish of soul. He's in the midst of trouble. He talks about the bulls of Bashan. How his enemies have gathered around him time and time again to take him down. I threw him there far. Because even though he's praying to God, you almost get that sense that he knows who God is and that he's God with him. But no matter how much he cries out to God, it's almost as if he's far from him. It's hard to get a hold of him. Like, God, why aren't you hearing me? I know you hear me, but maybe why aren't you responding? It's as if God is far from him. He knew that God did not leave him because he's still crying out to him, but God is far from him. He doesn't feel his presence. Maybe it's hard for him to reach out and touch God himself. Um, trust. He's looking, uh, I have saved down as well because he's looking for God to save him, to deliver him. And then finally I threw in there for saving because you almost get that sense that while the um, author is not saying that God has forsaken him, it's almost as if he's left alone in this uh, situation by himself. And he, even though he, goes, he knows that God is with him, it's too far for him to touch him. So he's left alone in this situation. So it's almost as if God's forsaken him. Like I said, there's no wrong answer or right answer to these, but is just us trying to better understand this passage to describe it in a nutshell for us to understand. How will we describe it? Now, what about some key phrases? What might be something that we might find used over and over again in Psalm 22? So they trusted in God, 
the trust never wavered, but yet it just felt like God was far from them. So even though they're crying out for why are they forsaking me, they still are trusting in God. They have not lost that. But they are crying out in the midst of their situation. What about some key verses? What might be some verses that we might use to describe this passage in a nutshell? Verse 1. And verse 1 states, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roar? Do any other verses maybe sit out? I know the very last verse says, They shall come and shall be their righteousness and their people that shall be poor that he has done this. Mm -hmm. So they shall come to a people. What might be some verses that describe this in a nutshell? Anybody else have any other ideas? Or anything else that came to mind? Twenty-seven, which states, "All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nation, nations shall worship Him." I threw in there also verses of eleven, twenty-two, and twenty-four, which state in verse eleven, "Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help me." Twenty-two, which states, "I will declare Thy name unto my brethren." In the midst of the congregation, while I praise thee. And then finally, I also include 23. 20, and 23. Well, we'll read 23 and 24. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him, all the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face far from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. So those are some verses that would describe this passage here in a nutshell. Now, if you look down in your notes, there's a uh, the next point is uh, I have quoted in the New Testament. As we're looking at the book of Psalms, one thing that I love is when something's quoted in the New Testament and I can reference it and pinpoint it and go back and forth it because it gives explanation on what it's talking about. The, the New Testament gives further understanding of what was prophesied in the Old Testament. But for the sake of today, we're going to skip that passage, and if we have time, we'll come back. You have it in your notes. You can see which verses in Psalm 22 were uh, quoted in the New Testament, and you have the references on where it was quoted, where it was referenced. So it's all right there for you if you want to look at it at a later time. But I want to go on a little bit farther, because when we're talking about these Psalms, we're talking about the Messiah. We're talking about Jesus Christ. And I, want, I don't want to spend weeks and weeks upon them, but I do want to talk about them. But when we look at the history of the psalm, we know that David was accredited as being the author. It is written to the person who was in charge of the temple choir because the whole point that David wanted to, the whole reason that David wanted to compile the book of Psalms in the first place was so that they had a Jewish songbook to play in the temple um, choir orchestra. So it was written to the person who's in charge of the temple orchestra. More than likely, the title of the psalm is taken from Ageleth Shahar. That uh, phrase there was in our big key phrases and words that we've talked about in weeks past to give us better understanding. More than likely, this is the title of the psalm, which is uh, Pine of the Morning. And while this phrase is uh, obscure through, uh, through and much concerning Hebrew poetry, music, and has been lost in history, we can assume that it is meant here to actually mean the hind of the morning as the title. Now, as we look at Psalm 22, and we look at Christ in it, we get the picture of Jesus Christ as it was portrayed in Isaiah. And Isaiah, that passage there, I should have wrote it down, but we, when we look at it and study it, it refers to Jesus Christ as the suffering servant. When we look at Psalm 22, that is exactly what we see. Jesus Christ in his, all, in his office as prophet, but with him being upon the cross, is 
portraying and talking about him as a suffering servant. According to Keith L. Brooks, this is the song of the cross. He also claims that we do not only seek the suffering of Christ, but also the glory that followed, and he draws that conclusion by comparing it to Matthew chapter 27. And we're not going to come uh, go there, but you can read that in your own time. But now as we look at Psalm 22, a little bit more detail in the last 15 minutes, we're going to focus on the actual crucifixion of Jesus Christ as contained within Psalm 22. Because that is exactly what we're looking at. Yes, we are looking at a man in agony, in turmoil, in trouble, who's surrounded by his enemies. But as we study it out and we compare it to the crucifixion, we can see clearly that the psalmist David was describing in detail, prophetically, the crucifixion of the Messiah. If we look at Psalm chapter 22, if someone would please read verses 1, 2, and 11. 1, 2, and 11. Oh my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and for the words of my glory? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. When we look at these verses here, they are describing the agony of the person contained within the psalm. God seems far from him, and he's crying out consistently and constantly for God to help him. If we compare this to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, his agony began before he was even taken captive. Where do we find him before the soldiers come? In the garden of Gethsemane. And how do we know that he was in agony in the garden of Gethsemane? When he prayed, God the blood. He prayed great drops of blood. When we look at that condition of great drops of blood, it may seem impossible for an individual to sweat great drops of blood or sweat out blood at all. But there is such a state when a person is in such agony and turmoil that their blood vessels actually break. And as he was praying fervently and sweating, that blood mixed in with his sweat, and then out it came. We also know that he was in agony in the garden because he did not cry out to God one time, let this cup pass from me. He didn't cry out two times, God, if it be your will, uh, be not your will, let this cup pass from me. But three different times he cried out in agony, in distress, while those who followed him were all sleeping. He was in a great state of agony. Does, that, does, does, not, does not that line up with the man we see here in Psalm 22? He's crying out to God, God deliver me. He knows that God hears him, because otherwise he wouldn't be praying. But he cries out three different times, God, be with me in the midst of my turmoil, in the midst of my trouble. Anyone who says that Jesus Christ did not know what was about to happen to him is a fool because he told his own disciples what was going to happen to him on several different occasions. Jesus Christ knew what lay before him that night. He knew that the cross stood there and he was resting in the shadow because it was about to come at any moment. And he was in such agony and turmoil because he knew what crucifixion was all about. But yet, he cried out to God in the midst of his trouble. We do not see Christ crying out to God only there, but we see it upon the cross. We know that he went back and forth between uh, Herod and Pontius Pilate for trial, and they pushed him aside and sent him back and forth. But you cannot tell me that Jesus Christ was not praying in the midst of the travel or in the middle of being placed in the prison, waiting to go to the next location. His soul was in agony and travail, and he knew what was about to happen. I'm sure he was crying out to God on more than just the occasion of the garden and the occasion of the cross. His soul was vexed. We can see the agony of this individual reflected 
time and time again throughout the crucifixion. Christ was ridiculed by the common people and while he was on the cross. Would someone please read Psalm 22, 7, Psalm 22, 7, and someone else read Matthew 27, 39. First we'll read Psalm 22, 7, and Matthew 27, 39. Oh, that, oh they that see me laugh, me in scorn, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, so when we look at the individual in um, Psalm 22, 7, his enemies are surrounding him. They're making fun of him. They laugh at him. They shoot at their lip. They're making comments. They're making smart remarks. What does Matthew chapter 27 and verse 39 say? They passed by their him, wagging their heads. So they passed by him, wagging their heads. And really, I think, Mom, if, if you go a verse farther, does that not, not mention the Pharisees and the scribes and their saying? And saying, Thou that destroys the temple and build it three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. So they ridicule. You said you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. That is exactly what we see in Psalm 22 and verse 7. He's ridiculed by the people around him. They laugh at him. They mock him. They make smart comments. And then when we look at the life of Christ, he was ridiculed by the common people. We saw that in uh, Matthew chapter 27. But was it just the common people that made fun of him and ridiculed him? No. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders make fun of Jesus Christ. They make smart comments. Others, you say, save yourself. Come down from that cross. Call for your legions of angels, and they shall remove you. What does Psalm chapter 22 and verse 12, 13, and 16 say? The strong bulls of Bashan. If we study out the strong bulls of Bashan, the bulls of Bashan, their goats, their rams, their lambs, everything about them in the land of Bashan were extraordinary. They were marvelous. They were far above ours. The strong bulls of Bashan can pass them about. Who were far above average when we look at the foot of the cross? It wasn't the common people. But we have reference that the scribes were there, the Pharisees were there, the, the priests were there. We know the, if we study out the life of Paul, him being part of the Sanhedrin, there were members of the Sanhedrin there. Um, one of the gentlemen who was found in the crowd, um, Joseph of Arimathea, he was part of the Sanhedrin, that group of members that guided the Jews. The strong bulls of Gilgit, the elders, the leaders, they were there. And they were mocking Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. They were ridiculing him. When we look also at the bulls of Bashan, they were fierce. Well, is that not what we see at the foot of the cross with the priests and the elders and the scribes? Jesus, you saved others. That's pretty fierce. Call on the angels and they'll save you. <coughs> others you saved, save yourself. They were fierce. They were bold. The leaders were there mocking him and ridiculing Jesus Christ. If we go to Psalm chapter 22 and verse 14, 14a and 15a, and I'll just go ahead and read these passages. And uh, for what it's worth, we're looking at Psalm 22, so we'll be spending most of our time there, and we'll probably spend all our time there for the last five minutes anyhow, but 14 and 15. I am poured out like wax, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth unto my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the death of death, 
As I look at the next point, I take it from 14a and 15a, which is, I am poured out like water. My strength is dried up like a pop shirt. When we look at the life of Jesus Christ and him being tortured there on the cross, do we not see this reflected in the body of Jesus Christ? His strength is God. He is weak. It is dried up like a posture. It is dry. There is no real, I hate to say substance there, but there is no real nourishment. Everything is spent. When we look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he was tortured at the whipping post. His strength was spent. He had to carry his own cross and stumble under the weight of it. His strength is spent. And we go back to 14. He, it, his strength was poured out like water. There's nothing left. Somebody else had to carry his cross up the hill for him. When we look at crucifixion itself, it wasn't just a matter that he was nailed to the tree. But how did he take each breath? After everything he went through, it wasn't, he wasn't able to pull himself up with his wrists. He had to push up with his feet. How many hours was he hanging upon that tree? He was there for roughly about three hours. Imagine that in it by itself, you hanging on a cross, even if you weren't um, in agony from the nails, the only way for you to take a breath was to push up with your feet. Can you imagine being in one position for three hours and having to push up for each and every breath you took? That in itself will be draining of strength and tiring. Yet everything Christ went through, it falls in line. I am poured out like water. Everything I have is gone. My strength is gone. My strength is dried up like a posture. There's basically nothing else left. He is weak. If we go to Psalm 22 and verse 14 and finish the rest of it, all of my bones are out of joint. And we'll continue with that phrase. When we look at crucifixion, and you can study, medical examiners have actually studied crucifixion and the results that it would probably have on an individual. And they've compared that also with the Shroud of Turin. But they say that within the first couple of minutes, because of his, the way that they nailed the wrists, nailed his hands out, that his shoulders would have popped out of joint. Within a few moments after that, more of the arm muscles would have been popped out of joint. And 14, all of my bones are out of joint. Crucifixion falls right in line with that. In Psalm 22, verse 15, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. When we look at Christ on the cross, he suffered from a great amount of thirst. That's why they were offering gall and vinegar to him. It wasn't just for the pain. Yes, it would have helped with the pain, but it was because his mouth was dry. He needed to drink. So when we look at this passage, it is still describing the crucifixion of the Messiah. And it reveals his great thirst. 22 and 18. They part my garments among them and cast lust upon my vesture. I, if I'm not mistaken, in Matthew 27, all of you already read that this morning. How the soldiers there at the foot of the cross gambled for the garment of Jesus Christ. They didn't want to break it into pieces, but they gambled for the garments of Jesus Christ. And we can go on and on and on within this passage. My heart is like wax. When we look at that and uh, the crucifixion, we know that when they pierced his side, out with came water and blood. That water indicates of the manner in which he died, which I described. If I remember, is, uh, uh, fixedly, uh, basically he suffocated death. 
And because of that, it formed a sack of fluid around his heart. And when they pierced his side and up to the heart to make sure he was dead, that fluid came out. We can talk about prophecy. They pierced my hands and my feet. We know that's exactly what happened to our Messiah upon the cross. They did not bind him to the cross with ropes, but rather they near, nailed him to the cross through his wrists and through his feet. But yet in the midst of it all, the psalm is closed with a thanksgiving praise. Why? Because at the end of it, Jesus Christ can go before the Father with thanksgiving. Because for the prize that was set before Jesus Christ, he endured the cross. And what was the prize that was set before him? Does, can anyone tell me what the prize, what was the whole reason that Christ suffered crucifixion in the first place? Why was he willing to go through with it? What was his prize? For us. For, us, for the church. So when we look at Psalm 22, while we see an act man in tremendous agony who cries out to a God who knows, he knows is there, but feels like he is far off. It's not a picture, but rather it was prophecy of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross and going through crucifixion for no other reason but to die for you and I. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point in time? If not, let us bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns one high and that there is none like you, Lord. Lord, even right now we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that it will take root in our hearts, that we may be tra transformed to the very image of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords, Lord. Anoint the pastor as he brings forth the word today. Anoint his mind and his lips to bring forth the words you have us to hear, Lord. I pray that everything that is done within these walls today and on this property would be pleasing to you, Lord. And even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, and no attack of the enemy may penetrate, Lord. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.